Hi there, and welcome to the channel of A Disappointed Man, with me, Jason Kennedy, The Disappointed Man. And in this video, I'm talking about Muriel Sparks' The Driver's Seat from 1970. Very short book, only 100 pages, a very curious book, a very funny book, a very interesting book. And the principal reason for its strangeness is its narration, because in most works of fiction, we're familiar with a narrator who's omniscient in some respect. Either they can see into the minds of all of the characters equally, or perhaps just the protagonist's mind, or they may shuttle between the consciousnesses of characters in different scenes. But here we have the device where the narrator cannot see at all into the minds of any of the characters. So almost precisely halfway through when Lisa, the central figure in this novel, is performing some actions, we get this. She finds the car keys that she failed to leave behind this morning and attaches them once more to her key ring. She puts the bunch of keys in her handbag, picks up her paperback book and goes out, locking the door behind her. Who knows her thoughts? Who can tell? Yes, who knows her thoughts? Who can tell? But the question here is, why can this narrator not know her thoughts or not tell? What is going on? And it's almost as if Lisa, who also seems to have problems understanding people's intentions, is the narrator of this fiction and is observing herself in this completely detached manner. Yes, so that is a very strange prospect. And what it creates in this novel is flatness. There is absolutely no depth here. When things are presented to us, it's not possible to determine what is significant. And so what we get are lists of things, or things being moved from one place to another. And I'll give you another example here. Um, Lisa and an old lady, Mrs. Fiedke, that she's up with walking around Italy are in a department store trying to buy some gifts and they walk into the department where they're selling televisions and here is this incredibly flat description of a salesman selling televisions. Two television screens, one vast and one small, display the same program, a wildlife documentary film which is now coming to an end, a charging herd of buffalo large on one screen and small on the other, cross the two patches of vision while music of an unmistakably finale nature sends them on their way with equal volume from both machines. The salesman turns down the noise from the larger set and continues to address his customers who have now dwindled to two, meanwhile keeping an interested eye on Lisa and Mrs. Fiedke who hover behind so this is very well crafted, strange writing. And I think what gives it its strangeness is the way equal weight is being attached to the formal qualities of the TV sets, their size, the volume, and what is on those screens, which has nothing below it. There's no sense in which you are entering into the picture in the normal manner in which we watch television. It's just another surface and the effect is one that suggests paranoia. And there was another paranoid work, deeply paranoid from 1970, J.G. Ballard's The Atrocity Exhibition. And to prepare for this video I thought I'll open it up and see if there's anything here that ties in with that sense of flatness, and it's perhaps indicative of the way this flatness permeates the entirety of Ballard's work and Sparks, that this is the very first thing I lighted upon. It's called Operating Formulae. Gesturing Catherine Austin into the chair beside his desk, Dr. Nathan studied the elegant and mysterious advertisements which had appeared that afternoon in the copies of Vogue and Paris Match. In sequence, they advertise. One, the left orbit and zygomatic arch of Marina Oswald. Two, the angle between two walls. Three, a neural interval, a balcony unit 
on the 27th floor of the Hilton Hotel, London. Four, a pause in an unreported conversation outside an exhibition of photographs of automobile accidents and on and on it goes. So you get the idea there. There's this disconnect, there's this flatness, there's this equivalence, there's this difficulty in finding the significant detail that will unlock meaning and another work which shares this quality throughout is Mark Hatton's Haddon's The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night Time where the autistic narrator cannot determine what is significant to his investigation and simply lists and includes everything and if he has to encounter it a second time then he repeats it word for word and we have to kind of hmm, and understand why this is going on. The method if you enjoyed this, you're going to enjoy Muriel Spark. And the last work I'm going to compare it to is one I've already reviewed, Hangover Square by Patrick Hamilton. And what's so intriguing here is how the narration mirrors Sparks, because in Hangover Square, the reader knows the intentions of the central character, but he doesn't know them. He alternates between two states. One is a normal waking state, and one is his schizophrenic state. And in that state, he's hatched a terrible plot. But as he returns to his normal self, he's not aware of what it is. And so we watch him sleepwalk towards his destiny. And in Spark's novel, what we find is we the reader don't know the intentions of Lisa. But, effectively, it's the same thing. We watch her sleepwalk towards her destiny, and when it arrives, we are shocked. Whereas in Hangover Square, of course, it's only the other characters who are shocked. So, very interesting parallels there. And I think that is all I'm going to say in this brief review. I strongly recommend picking up this book. If you haven't read Spark before, it's a treat. If you've only read The Prime of Miss Jean Brody, it's time perhaps to give some of her other works a try. A very fine and quirky idiosyncratic writer. So I will finish with my usual mantra and let you go about your day. Be safe, be strong, and until the next time, Nanu Nanu!